Once upon a time, as all good stories begin, we begin in Victorian England on a busy London street the day before Christmas. Windows are decorated with garland and wreaths hang on the doors. Couples stroll along looking at the shops. Children play in the street. Carolers are singing. Friends and strangers greet each other happily. Fred, a fine young gentleman, greets Mr. Longhorn as he gives him a shilling for the poor. My word, I love Christmas. There's a spirit in the air. It is a time of joy and celebration. It is a time when people are more kind and more considerate. Well, most people, that is. They have a small laugh and as Mrs. Pinkerton, Scrooge's housekeeper, greets Fred. Fred, aren't you a joyous sight? Mrs. Pinkerton, how are you? I assume my uncle is treating you well. Is he giving you the day off tomorrow? Oh, we shall see. We'll breach that discussion later. Quite right. For there are those who see Christmas as a waste of time and energy, and my Uncle Scrooge is not only a member of that tribe, but in all likelihood their loudest cheerleader and most ardent supporter. Oh, he hates Christmas. <laughs> he hates anything that does not make him richer, and so he hates Christmas most of all. Fred leaves Mrs. Pinkerton and starts walking toward his uncle's counting house. Fred stands outside the counting house, where an old sign hangs very much in need of repair, with the name Scrooge and Marley. It's a very cold-looking building. No decoration, no warmth, no Christmas. It was just as Scrooge himself. Fred looks up at the old sign. Poor Mr. Marley. Uncle will no doubt finish his life like Mr. Marley, cold and alone. It might have been because seven years ago this very night, Scrooge's business partner and only friend in the world, Jacob Marley, had died. Marley was long dead and buried. This you must remember, or nothing wonderful can come of the tale that you are about to hear. Meanwhile, Fred moves to a window to look inside. And so, on a crisp and chilly Christmas Eve, my Uncle Scrooge... A tight-fisted, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner is... Can you believe it? Conducting business in his counting house. Inside at his desk, Scrooge and Mr. Marsden are concluding some business while Mr. Longhorn and Bob Cratchit wait patiently. One hundred pounds apiece. <laughs> My word, a fair profit, I dare say. Wouldn't you, Mr. Marsden? A nice, tidy sum to add to a record year, Mr. Scrooge. <laughs> yes, 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 indeed. And to add to our success, I have some other business deals I would like to propose. I've no doubt they will prove as profitable as our last enterprise. Without a doubt, sir. Without a doubt. Excellent. Shall we discuss them at length? Nothing would please me more, Mr. Scrooge. Unfortunately, I have some urgent business across town. But I am available tomorrow. On Christmas Day? Most certainly on Christmas Day. It's a day like any other as far as I'm concerned. Why should it be absent of... My feelings precisely, Mr. Barson. Ah, I sense we are kindred spirits when it comes to business. Until tomorrow, then. Good day. Good day, Mr. Scrooge. Um, Mr. Scrooge, there's a Mr. Longhorn here to see you, sir. Well, show him in. We mustn't keep clients waiting. Yes. Uh, th this way, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Scrooge, and uh, Merry Christmas. How do you do, Mr. Longhorn? I understand you have some business to propose. Uh, the business of charity, sir. Ah, charity, I see. Did you know about this, Mr. Cratchit? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. He said he had some business to discuss. Uh, yes, Mr. Scrooge. Uh, charity is everyone's business. And so at this festive time of the year, a few of us are raising a fund to help the poor and the destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are they indeed? Oh, my. 
Are there no prisons? Uh, plenty of prisons. And the Union workhouses, are they still in operation? They are, although I wish I could say they were not. And the treadmill and poor law are still in full vigor then? Both very busy, sir. Oh, thank God. I'm very glad and relieved to hear it. I was afraid from what you had said that something had happened to stop them in their useful work. Good day, sir. Uh, but, Mr. Scrooge, these institutions scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude. And so a few of us are collecting money to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We uh, choose this time of year because it's a time above all others when uh, want is most key keenly felt and abundance rejoiced. What may I put you down for? You may put me down for nothing. Nothing? I don't make myself merry at Christmas, and I certainly can't afford to make idle people merry. I help support the establishments I have mentioned, and they cost far more than enough. Those who are in need must go there. But money, uh, many can't go there, and, and many would rather die. Well, then let them do it, and thereby decrease the surplus population. Mr. Scrooge! Mr. Longhorn! It is not my business what happens to these people. Why should I care about them? I dare say they care little for me. It is enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere in other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, sir. Good day. But Mr. Scrooge! Good day! Scrooge turns his back on Mr. Longhorn. Defeated, Mr. Longhorn turns toward the door. Bob gives him an apologetic nod and returns to his desk. Just after Mr. Longhorn walks out, Fred enters and cheerfully greets his Uncle Scrooge. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Ah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? You don't mean that, I am sure. I most certainly do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be so merry? You're poor enough. Come now, what right have you to be so miserable? You're rich enough. What else can I be when I live in a world of fools such as this? Merry Christmas. If I had my way, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle! Nephew! Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone then. Much good may it do you. Much good it has ever done you. But, Uncle, I have always thought of Christmas time as a, a kind, forgiving, charitable time. It is the one time of the year when men and women open their hearts and think of all people as fellow passengers to the grave, and not as another race of creatures bound on different journeys. And therefore, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good, and will do me good, and I say God bless it. Oh, that's well said, I must say. Oh. Oh, you agree with my nephew, do you, Mr. Cratchit? Well, I do, sir. And think, uh, and th I think Christmas is a joyous time. Do you? Well, let me hear another word from you, Mr. Bob Cratchit, and you'll spend your Christmas looking for another job. Is that understood? Yes, Mr. Scrooge. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. I'm most impressed. It's a wonder you don't go into politics, run for office, become a member of Parliament. <laughs> what a good idea. I just might do that. Can I count on your vote, Uncle? Ah. Oh, Uncle, don't be angry. Come, dine with us tomorrow. No, thank you. But why not? A man's first priority is to secure his financial future. You should have never gotten married. Why did you? Why did uh, I uh, get... Well, because I fell in love. Because you fell in love? What nonsense. Ah, good afternoon. Have you never been in love, Uncle? No, I have not. No? No. Have you come here for the sole purpose of keeping me from my work? Not at all. I've come here because I have something that belongs to you. Do you? 
From the inside pocket of his jacket, Fred removes a bundle of old letters. What are those? Letters. Letters? Yes, Uncle, letters. Uh, I was going through an old trunk of my mother's, and I came across some letters you wrote to her when you were a much younger man. And those letters are from a very different Uncle Scrooge than the person who sits before me now. You read them? I might have read one or two, maybe three. Uh, Can you blame me? How dare you! Those were private letters between your mother and I. You had no right to read them. Now hand them over. I'm sorry if I upset you, Uncle. That was not my intention. I I thought you'd be pleased to get them back. Uh, Here, let me make it up to you. Come have dinner with us tomorrow. No, thank you. Now give me those letters. Not until you agree to come to dinner. (sighs) You were always an obstinate child. Stubborn like my Uncle Scrooge, my dad used to say. Do not bring your father up to me, young man. Well, if you won't have Christmas with us, Uncle, how about you, Bob? How about you and your fine family come join us for Christmas? Oh, uh, that would be very kind of you, sir, and and most unexpected, but I'm afraid I'm scheduled to work. Good Lord, on Christmas? Now that is a humbug. What mean-spirited old money-grubber would make you work on Christmas Day, I wonder? Uh, If I was to stop him half a crown for it, you'd think him ill-used, and yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. But, but Mr. Scrooge, it, it's only once a year. <laughs> That's a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Bah! I am surrounded by fools. Very well. If you must have it, take the day. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, then I take it that means you're free to come dine with us, Uncle? No, 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 no. Mr. Cratchit may have his day to do with as he intends. I will use my day for more profitable enterprises. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. But I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas cheer to the last. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Fred puts the letters on Scrooge's desk. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. And a Merry Christmas, Bob, to you and your family. Thank you, sir. Same to yours. And my invitation to Christmas dinner stands. You are welcome to join us. Oh, that's most kind of you, sir. And it is very much appreciated. But we like to celebrate at home and have the whole family together for Christmas Day. There's nothing more important than family, is there, Bob? No, sir. Nothing. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, sir. Merry Christmas, Uncle. Scrooge goes back to working at his desk. The letters all sit where Fred left them. As the day grows darker and colder, Scrooge stops his work and picks up the letters. They are bound by a ribbon. As Scrooge unties the bundle, he hears a whisper and other soft, ghostly sounds from beyond. Scrooge! Scrooge stops and looks up. He looks about warily and then dismisses the sound and returns to the letters. Scrooge! Scrooge! Scrooge looks up again, looking rather pale and concerned. Um, Cratchit, did you call? Uh, call, Mr. Scrooge? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, call just now. My name. No, Mr. Scrooge. Uh, is there something you want? Scrooge hesitates, listens, and then dismisses the sound. Uh, no, 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 no. Nothing. Cratchit begins to pack, pack up his desk as the hour of closing is reached. Well, Cratchit, you have tomorrow to do with as you like. But I expect you here at your desk all the early earlier the following morning. Is that clear? Quite clear, sir. Thank you, Mr. Scrooge. Mark my words, Mr. Cratchit. 
This is a harsh and cruel world where your only shield against the cold hand of poverty is acquisition, profit, and gain. What's Christmas time to you but a time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? Bah! Yes, sir. Good night, Mrs. Scrooge. Good day. Cratchit exits the counting house and once outside, whistles a happy tune and laughs as he rushes off to be with his family. Scrooge opens one of the letters and begins to read. Scrooge! What's that? Hello? Is someone there? Scrooge! Whoever's there, I'm warning you. I'm armed. Yes, yes, I am armed. So you had better show yourself. Come on. Out from the shadows, whoever you are. Ah! Partly composing himself, Scrooge crosses to the door and opens it to find Mr. Fillmore. Ah, Mr. Scrooge, I am so sorry to disturb you on Christmas Eve, but I know how long the hours are that you work, and took the chance that I might find you here still at your office at this late hour. What trick are you up to? Trick, Mr. Scrooge? Yes. What game are you playing at? I'm playing no game, I assure you, sir. Is something wrong? No, wrong. Um, no, 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 nothing's wrong. Scrooge tosses the letters into the trash. Well then, Mr. Fillmore, I assume you are here to make a payment. Ah, uh, yes, well, uh, I've run into a bit of a problem, you see, and I need to make some sort of arrangement for an extension, Mr. Scrooge. The terms of the loan were quite clear when you sign them. Yes, of course, sir, but it's not easy finding work at the moment, you, you see, and if I could just have a little more time, I'm good for it. I'm a hard worker. None of this is my concern, Mr. Fillmore. If you are unable to pay off your loan, you must pay the penalty and do so in a timely fashion or forfeit the collateral you have offered or find yourself in debtor's prison. There is no court in the land that will not rule in my favor. Maybe so, sir, but that still doesn't make it right. I have a right to be paid the money owed me. But, Mr. Scrooge, I'm sure you've seen tough times yourself and have needed a helping hand from time to time. God helps those who help themselves. Good night, Mr. Fillmore. A full payment is due by the end of the year. Were you always so cold and unfeeling a man, Mr. Scrooge? You may find me cold and unfeeling, sir, but I would venture to say I am a man of my word. A man whose word carries weight. A man whose word allows him the ability to strike a deal and back it up with his signature. My signature is worth something. Yours, it would appear, if you continue to treat your financial obligations and business dealings in this manner, will soon be worthless. Now, if you will excuse me, I am off to the Nags Head pub for a well-earned and well-deserved supper. Good day, sir. Mr. Fillmore, on the verge of tears, leaves the office. Scrooge puts on his hat and coat, looks about the office, he gives a frustrated huff and leaves. Out on the street, it is late and cold. A low fog hovers over the streets as Scrooge hastily walks to his home. Much like his office and himself, Scrooge's home is dark and depressing. It is the only home with no cheer, no happiness, and no color. It is a deep, dark brown, begging on black color. A young boy stands near the door to Scrooge's home. A gentleman and a lady drop a coin into the boy's cup as they pass. Bless you, Governor. Scrooge enters from the other end of the street and approaches the boy. What are you doing on my doorstep, boy? Nothing, sir. Nothing. Bah! 
Yes, sir. You wouldn't happen to have any change, would you, sir? For a poor boy just trying to make a few bobs? Begging is not something I wish to pay for. Now be gone before I call a constable. Go on, hurry up. Go beg somewhere else, not here. Not at my door. You want money? Then you should earn it. Go work in the coal mines or find yourself some other porch to haunt. Scrooge watches the boy run off into the night and then digs in his pocket for a key. There's a sudden chill in the air as Scrooge puts the key into the lock and the horrifying distorted face of Scrooge's long dead partner, Jacob Marley, appears in the center of a large knot in the wooden door. Scrooge! Scrooge! Ah! Scrooge backs away startled. The door returns to normal and slowly swings open. Fog from inside the dwelling mingles with the fog on the street. Hello? Is someone there? Hello? Mrs. Pinkerton enters from inside and steps out into the street. Scrooge is relieved, but troubled. Oh, Mr. Scrooge, I was just leaving. You're running rather late tonight, even for you, sir. And I do have my own family to think of. And what with tomorrow being Christmas and all, there's a lot of work needs doing. Now, I know Christmas means little to you, sir, but we mothers and wives find ourselves occupied with much preparation for the day. Yes, 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 yes. We all busy ourselves with what we think is important, Mrs. Pinkerton. Now, I've left your dinner by the fire, Mr. Scrooge, and put a cover on it to keep it warm. And I put the bed warmer in the bed. It's a cold night, cold to the bones. The only people who don't feel this cold are the dead, I reckon. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, uh, Mrs. Pinkerton. Yes, Mr. Scrooge. Have you noticed anything peculiar? Peculiar? In what way? No strange noises, perhaps? No stranger than usual. This old place creaks and groans like an old man. Everything is quite normal, then. Everything is as it should be, Mr. Scrooge. Why? Ah, is there something wrong? Well, it's just I thought for a moment that, um, uh, um, uh, uh, no, I have been surrounded by such fools this entire day that their silly nonsense and talk of Christmas has me hearing and seeing things. Good night, Mrs. Pinkerton. Good night, Mr. Scrooge. Will you be taking breakfast at your usual time tomorrow? I see no reason why I should adjust my schedule. Ah, very well, Mr. Scrooge. I will see you first thing in the morning. Then I'm off for the rest of the day. Ah, very well, then. Scrooge hurries into his house, slamming the large door behind him. As Mrs. Pinkerton bundles herself up, she looks about the street. The ghostly shadow of Jacob Marley moves across the exterior of the house. Mrs. Pinkerton looks about and then hurries off into the fog. Inside Scrooge's large home, he has very little light. In the master bedroom, there's a small fire in the fireplace, and beside the fire is a high back chair. The four-poster bed dominates the room, Scrooge sits in the chair wearing his slippers, nightshirt, and cap. He holds a bowl of stew in his hands. Such nonsense, Christmas. A kind, hospitable, charitable time. Humbug, I say. It's all humbug. Scrooge goes to take a spoonful of stew and blows on it. He's about to eat the spoonful when he hears Marley's ghost. Scrooge! Scrooge drops his spoon into the bowl. What's this? No, this is 
It's a humbug, I say. A humbug. Scrooge, shaking with fear, rushes to the door and double bolts all the locks. Ah, there. Not even Hannibal and his elephants could break down this door. You hear me? Hey, I advise you to leave this place at once, whoever you are. Scrooge! Leave now before I shout for the law and have you arrested. You hear me? You'll spend your Christmas in a jail cell if I have anything to say about it. As Scrooge backs away from the door, the ghost of Jacob Marley starts stepping through the door. He's a ghostly white and bound by a long chain made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. Oh, oh dear God, Master of Heaven, what is this? Oh. Answer me, dreadful phantom! Who and what are you? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Marley? No, no, it cannot be. You are dead and long buried, long buried. Do you not believe in me? No, I do not. You doubt your own eyes and ears. I do, yes, I do. In this matter, they are not to be trusted. You may be nothing more than an undigested bit of beef, yes, yes, a, a glob of mustard, a chunk of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. I say you are nothing more than an upset stomach, making me hear and see things that do not exist. Mark my words, you unholy vision, there's more of gravy than of grave about you. Ha! Whatever you are. His chains move forward and wrap themselves around Scrooge, lifting him and drawing him towards Marley. Oh, no, no mercy, dreadful phantom, please release me. Man of worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do, I do, I do, yes I do. I suppose I must, I believe in you. Please have mercy, Marley. Why do you walk the earth and haunt me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk among his fellow men. And if that spirit does not do so in life, it is doomed to do so after death. After death? Yes. And to wander the world without rest and witness what it cannot share, but have might shared in life and turn to happiness. Why are you shackled? Who has done this horrible thing to you? I have done it to myself. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. The weight and length of the chain you bear yourself was as heavy and as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. Yours is a monstrous chain. Marley's chain releases Scrooge, dropping him to the floor. Oh, no. No, Marley. Say it is not so. You have done no wrong. You were always a good man of business. Business? Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. Have mercy, Marley, please. I have none to give, but you may yet have a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and a hope of my procuring Ebenezer. Thank you. You were always a good friend to me, Marley. Ebenezer Scrooge, you will be visited by three spirits. Oh, visited by three spirits? Is that the chance and hope you mentioned? It is. Ah, well, uh, to be visited, I, I, I mean, I, I think, 
I, I think I'd rather not be visited if it's all the same to you, Barley. I'm not so sure how much more of this I can take. Without their visits, you will be doomed and cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Doomed? Expect the first when the clock strikes one. What sort of spirits are they, Marley? Expect the second when the clock strikes two. How will I know them? And the third when the clock strikes three. What sort of things will they do to me? I can say no more. I can stay no longer. Remember, Ebenezer, for your own sake, what has passed between us. Suddenly the door flies open and the chains on Marley start pulling him toward the door. Scrooge hurries to his chair, peeking out in fear. Marley's ghost starts dragging back toward the large door of the bedchamber. Groaning and reaching out, Marley is pulled out the door. The large door slams shut with a thunderous boom, as if locking Marley away forever. No, 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 no. No, no, this is all nonsense, nonsense, a nightmare, nothing more than a bad dream. Yes, of course, that explains it. I'm having a dream, <laughs> a nightmare. There are no such things as ghosts and spirits. It's all in your mind. Do you hear me, Ebenezer? All in your mind. You will not be haunted. Humbug. Scrooge sits in his chair. His fear slowly turning back to disdain. He peeks around the side of the chair a few times, just to be sure he isn't going mad. When the clock strikes one. In the darkness, the windows break open. The light of the moon illuminates the bedroom. A large gust of wind and snow fills the room. The snow swirls around as if dancing and then falls to the floor. And left standing is the first spirit, the ghost of Christmas past. Scrooge uncovers his eyes as the wind dies. The ghost of Christmas past is dressed in a white robe and looks like a young woman. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Oh, thank God, you're not as terrifying as I feared. <laughs> Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Oh, are you indeed? Long past? No, your past. My past? Why my past? For your welfare. Come, Ebenezer, take my hand. I have much to show you. Scrooge reluctantly puts his hand out and takes the spirit's hand. She giggles and snaps her fingers. The snow on the floor starts swirling around the two. Spirit, what is this? Hold tight, Ebenezer. Scrooge closes his eyes, afraid of what is coming. In an eruption of snow, they disappear from the room. In a flash of snow, the ghost of Christmas past and Scrooge arrive in an old countryside dormitory kitchen of the King's Head boarding school for boys. Ebenezer, as a young boy of eight, is standing in the room with the scullery maid, who is reading a letter. Scrooge doesn't notice them, but walks to the window instead. Good heavens! This is where I grew up. I was a boy here. Why, why look out there? It's Archibald Coulson. Bless my soul, old Archie. <laughs> was always getting into trouble, that one. Oh, nothing serious, mind you. Just boyish mischief. Scrooge turns back to the ghost and sees his younger self for the first time. Good Lord, Spirit, that's... that's... These are the shadows of things that have been. They cannot see us, nor can we change or influence them. Come, Ebenezer, listen. The scullery maid finishes reading the letter and then sizes up a much younger Ebenezer. 
Well, Master Scrooge, it would appear, according to the headmaster, that you and I are to spend Christmas together. Not to go home? No. Apparently your father would prefer you to stay here. I must say that it's a bit irregular, but I suppose we must make the best of it, eh? Yes, sir. Er, yes, ma'am. I like to spend the holidays reading. It is the only time of year where I don't have to spend all my time in on the ground cleaning up after you lot, and I enjoy some quiet solitude. I do hope you will follow my example and pass the time in such a manner as this. I will have the headmaster select a few books that might be of interest to a boy your age, Robinson, Cru Robinson Crusoe and the like. You may take your meals in the kitchen with me instead of the dining hall if that is agreeable. Yes, ma'am. Oh, come now, Master Scrooge. You may not be home for Christmas, but you at least have a roof over your head and food. There are many in this world with far less than that. If you want more than this, then I suggest you put your nose to the grindstone, boy. God rewards those who work hard, and he punishes those who don't. Yes, ma'am. As the little Ebenezer and the scullery maid leave, Scrooge looks upon his younger self and wipes away a tear. What is the matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing? Well, there was a boy at my door last night. You are reminded of him. He was begging for money. Yes. I... I should have given him something, I suppose. If I was to give every poor child or man or woman that fell upon hard times my money, what would be left for me? We can give more than just money, Ebenezer. We can give our time and our labor to help those in need. But it is not my business. If not yours, then whose? Come, Ebenezer, let us see another Christmas. Christmas past snaps her fingers, bringing the snow into a swirl. When snow settles, they are in a schoolroom. Scrooge is now age 15. He sits at a desk writing a letter when Fan enters and interrupts him. Oh, dear brother. Fan? Yes, dear brother. Oh, my word. It's Fan. Oh, dear Fan, how good it is to see you. I've missed you so. Fan runs over to Ebenezer and embraces him. He holds her. Scrooge watches as if he can still feel her embrace. My fan, what a surprise. I'm so very happy to see you. Pray, what has brought you here? I have come to bring you home, dear brother. Home, little fan? Yes, home for good and all. Home for ever and ever. But how? Father has changed. Has he indeed? Well, I'll believe that when I see it. But he has. He has become so much kinder than he used to be. That home's like heaven. Is it? Well, that is a blessing. Last night, Father spoke so kindly and gently to me when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should. You must. And he sent me in a coach to bring you. Can you believe it? Hardly. But I am very happy nonetheless. Isn't it wonderful? Yes, how extraordinary. And you are to be a man and are to never come back here. But first, we're to be together all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in all the world. <sighs> you are quite a woman, little fan. They hug again and then run out as Ebenezer gathers up his things for their journey back home. Oh, fan, it has been so long, dear sister. She was always a delicate creature, whom a breath might have withered. Yes, but she had a large heart. She was very generous and kind. She didn't have an enemy in the world. Oh, Fan, how I have missed you. She died a woman. Yes, and far too young. What kind of God allows that, I ask you? She should have lived. She had children. One child. Your nephew Fred. Yes, his birth brought her death. He is not so unlike his mother in appearance, or disposition, is he? No, that is true, he is not. 
But men need to be tough in order to get ahead in this world. My nephew is too soft-hearted. Is he? Yes. I have tried so many times to make him understand the importance of hard work and industry, but my advice seems to have little effect upon him. It goes in one ear and out the other. I'm sorry to say this, but he is a fool and will always be so. And yet he seems happy. Come, Ebenezer, there is more to see. Scrooge takes the ghost hand. She snaps and they disappear in a burst of snow. In another flash of snow, Scrooge and the ghost appear in the work hall of Ephraim Fezziwig. Ebenezer, now a young man of 21, is working at his desk. He's happy having found work and love, and is whistling a happy tune. Good Lord! You know this place. Know it? <laughs> Why, yes, I know it. I was apprenticed here! Ha ha ha! Just then, Mr. Fezziwig comes through the door, followed by Jacob Marley. And look, it's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again. Ebenezer, I'd like you to meet a business associate of mine, Jacob Marley. Very pleased to meet you, Mr. Marley. Ebenezer crosses and shakes Marley's hand. Scrooge walks up to Jacob. Curse you, Marley. You brought me right back here because of your own misfortunes in death. Ebenezer, he cannot see or hear you, and your actions brought you here. So, you're the young man I've been hearing so much about. Ebenezer has a keen mind when it comes to business, Jacob. Why, year over year, we've more than doubled our profits. Can you believe it? Uh, Mr. Fezziwig, sorry to interrupt, but Josiah Tabiner is here to see you. Oh dear, what does he want now? Look at that. It's Dick Wilkins. To be sure, bless me, yes, that he is. Oh, you were a very good friend once. I'm not sure, sir. He would not say. Perhaps you could... Ask him to call back later. Tell him uh, that I'm busy. I tried, sir, but he says the matter is urgent and insists on speaking with you at once. Oh, dear. Well, I suppose I should go see him then. If you'll excuse me, Jacob, I won't be long. Oh, that's quite all right. You go ahead and attend to Mr. Taverner. I'd like a word with your young prodigy here, Mr. Scrooge. So, tell me, Mr. Scrooge, in your professional opinion, is old Fezziwig conducting his business in such a manner as to maximize your profits? Uh, well, Mr. Marley, I don't think it's right for me to comment on my employer's business affairs. Oh, come now. I'm asking your opinion, not as a friend of Fezziwig's, but as a man of business. Is old Fezziwig... Well, to put it plainly, making as much money as he could? Mm, Mr. Fezziwig, while a good man, but not always a business, unfortunately, has other priorities. <laughs> I thought so. I was going to buy him out, Mr. Scrooge. I'd even made him an offer, and then you come on and the scene, and suddenly old Fezziwig is drowning in money. And I ask myself, how did he manage that? Well, he didn't manage it, did he? You did. <laughs> You're the one. And a very shrewd man of business you are, Mr. Scrooge. I am most impressed. Why, thank you, Mr. Marley. That's very kind of you to say. Nonsense. I speak the truth. If you let your heart rule your business, like old Fezziwig does, I would call you a fool and say you deserve any punishment your foolishness gets you. But you are no fool, are you, Mr. Scrooge? I don't think of myself as a fool, but I do think there's more to life than business. Ah, that's Fezziwig talking. Life is business, and the business of life is profit. And you and I must talk business. I am fully prepared to offer you a position in my firm. 
Lord. Are you indeed, sir? Yes. I have been seeking a keen young man that I can groom to be my partner. And I dare say from my inquiries that you appear to be that man. If you hadn't come along, old Fezzi would, we would have ended up in the poorhouse this winter instead of celebrating Christmas. Why not come work for me where you can reap all the profits of your labor? A junior partner to begin with, but I promise you an equal partnership if you prove yourself worthy. My word, Mr. Marley, that's very kind of you. And I am very tempted and overwhelmed by your generous offer, but... But... Uh, but Mr. Fezziwig has been more than fair with me, and I feel I'm, I, I owe him a debt of gratitude. You are loyal, I will say that. Well, you needn't decide right now, Mr. Scrooge, but you must make a point of coming to see me in the new year so we can discuss matters further. You have a great future ahead of you, Ebenezer, if you're willing to take it. Mr. Fezziwig and Mr. Wilkins return. Mr. Fezziwig is in a slightly frustrated state. That Mr. Tanner will be the death of me. Why do business with him then? Uh, he's been a client of mine for many years and stuck with me when times were hard, so I feel it only fair that I stick with him during these, his hard times. Ebenezer, uh, make note that Mr. Tabner's payment for the lumber we shipped to him last month will be moved uh, to the beginning of March. Yes, Mr. Fezziwig. Poor fellow. Uh, now, Jacob, you must stay and have a glass of punch and enjoy us in celebrating the holiday. Thank you, no, Mr. Fezziwig. I'm afraid I have some other business to attend to. On Christmas Eve? A small matter, but a matter that demands my attention nonetheless. Good day, sir. Merry Christmas, Mr. Marley. Yes, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Mr. Scrooge. Merry Christmas, sir. Well, here it is, Christmas Eve, and here we are still discussing business. That will never do. Uh, come, Ebenezer. Uh, come, Dick. It's time to forget all about work and have some fun. All right, everyone. Clear the floor. Bring on the fiddler and the food and the punch. Uh, come now, where my, where my wife and daughters. Uh, let us celebrate. As a fiddler enters, so does Mrs. Fezziwing, her daughters, friends, and neighbors, carrying punch, gifts, food, and decorations. The young men of the business move the desks and cabinets from the center of the room. Great tables are filled with food and set in the corners, and the fiddler begins to fiddle as the couples line up and do a traditional ballroom dance. Bell lines up opposite Scrooge. Oh, my word. It is Belle. Look at how young she is, how beautiful. You know this woman? Know her? Oh, yes, indeed I do. Oh, Belle. Belle, how wonderful to see you. He cannot hear you. Is there no way for me to speak to her? She is but a memory. Ebenezer dances with Belle and the two are having a grand time. Scrooge watches from the side and finds himself enjoying the music and dancing along with the couples, clapping his hands and shadowing himself and Belle as they dance around the work hall. This is a happy memory for him and it sparks a joy that is not entirely dead in the old man. The song ends and the couples applaud and Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig are beside Ebenezer and Bill. Oh, why, husband, you never told me that our dear Mr. Scrooge was such an accomplished dancer. Yes, my dear, it would appear that young Ebenezer has feet for dancing as well as a head for business. <laughs> Good lad. What more could you ask for in a husband, I wonder, Bell? Uh, now, my dear, uh, we're making the young couple blush. Uh, come, let us attend to our other guests. Mr. Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig mingle with the other guests as they talk and drink and enjoy the party. Belle and Ebenezer head over to a table filled with savory treats to speak privately. 
Scrooge and the Ghost follow. Don't be embarrassed, Ebenezer. They're only teasing. I I know, but it it takes a great deal more than being able to dance to provide for a family and a wife in this harsh world. It takes time to build wealth and position. Time that you, my dear and beautiful Belle, may not wish to wait. If only there's some small sign by which I could know your heart. Belle softly kisses Ebenezer. There's a tenderness and love between them. I love you, Ebenezer, and have told you often that I will wait until our fortunes are better. Well, then, speaking of fortunes, Mr. Jacob Marley seems willing to make me an offer to be a junior partner in his firm. Can you believe it? Are you not happy here? Uh, Very. Uh, But if given the opportunity to improve one's position in life, I see no reason not to take it. Why? Does it trouble you? From what I know of Mr. Marley, I'm not so certain he's the kind of man you should be working for. Oh, nonsense. He's successful and rich, and if he takes an interest in my future, then I should at least consider his offer. Just then, Dick Wilkins interrupts Ebenezer and Bill. And what are you two up to? We're not up to anything. Oh, well then, perhaps I could convince Bell to join me for a dance. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilkins, but my dance card is already filled. Is it? Come now, what's going on here? You can tell your friend Dick Wilkins. Well, uh, if you must know, Bell and I plan to marry. Do you? <laughs> I thought there was something going on between you two. Well, congratulations, Ebenezer. Congratulations, Belle. I wish the two of you a long and happy life. Thank you, Dick. And I'm sure that one day you'll find a fine young woman and marry her and have a very happy and fine family of your own. If I'm ever fortunate enough to meet someone as beautiful and sweet as you are, Belle, then I hope I'm smart enough to let her know how I feel and snatch her up before someone else does. Again, congratulations. What a grand night. Grand indeed. Yes, and all thanks to old Fezziwig. What a fine and generous man he is. Yeah, yeah. To our dear Mr. Fezziwig, may he have a long life and may good fortune follow him all his days. Well said. Agreed. I had forgotten old Fezziwig had such a generous spirit. Generous? How can you say that? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four at the most. Why does he deserve such praise? It's not the amount he spent, spirit. It's in his power to make us happy or unhappy, to make our work a pleasure or a toil. His power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. Why, the happiness he gives to his employees is as generous and great as if it had cost a fortune. So, you no longer believe that fools such as old Fezziwig here should be boiled in their own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through their heart? Uh, uh, well, I, 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 I didn't mean old Fezziwig. No, 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 no. He was a good master. A very good master. I liked working for him. He treated me well. Something troubles you, I think. I... I was just thinking about my own clerk, Bob Cratchit. I would like to have said something to him just now. That's all. The fiddler begins another tune, and the couples line up ready to dance. Now, I'm sorry, Belle, but if Scrooge gets to spend a lifetime with you, then I think I should at least get one dance. Is that too much to ask? Ebenezer? Oh, go on. Put the poor man out of his misery. But only one dance, mind you, and then she's all mine, Foster. Dick and Belle join the other dancers. Ebenezer gets grabbed by one of the Fezziwig daughters and joins in the dancing. Come, Ebenezer. Oh, must we go? Can't we stay a little while longer? We cannot. But why not? There is still much to see, and my time grows short. Come, hurry. Scrooge reluctantly takes the hand of Christmas past, who snaps another whirlwind of snow. When 
the snow settles, Scrooge and Christmas past, see Jacob Marley at the desk. Ebenezer, now age 27, stands to one side. Mr. Fezziwig is reading the document before him. After some time, Fezziwig puts down the document. He's quite defeated. Are you quite satisfied, Mr. Fezziwig? You offered me a great deal more than this uh, amount five years ago, Mr. Marley. That was five years ago, and your fortunes have changed. Two shillings on the pound is more than fair. You won't get a better offer than that. And if you wait much longer, Mr. Fezziwig, your holdings may end up being entirely worthless. I offer you this amount only because of our long association and the business we have done in the past. The hard truth is you have little choice in the matter. So it would appear. With a heavy sigh and a broken soul, Mr. Fezziwig signs the paper. You've made the right decision. You have until the end of the week to vacate the premises. You are free to take whatever personal items you like, but remember, anything in the company name now belongs to us. Cheer up, old man. You're not completely without means. Mr. Fezzerwig quickly gathers himself up and leaves before he starts crying in front of his former apprentice. Uh, Ebenezer, what a bargain, eh? I would gladly have paid twice, three times the amount. You never accept the first offer. It is always far below what the buyer is willing to pay. Poor fool. With business sense like that, is it any wonder he drove his company into the ground? Ebenezer stares at the door, silent, just staring. Come on, what's the matter? You feeling sorry for Fezziwig, are we? I'm just worried about what will become of the old man, that's all. He's only in this situation because of his own doing. How many times have I told you, Ebenezer, business is business, and if you let your emotions and personal feelings interfere, it clouds your judgment. Yes, yes, of course, you are right. Business is business. And the only thing that matters in business is making a profit. And making the biggest profits you can. Right, Jacob. Right you are. Come on, let's celebrate. Let's toast our success. As the ruthless businessmen celebrate, Bell comes into the office. Ah, uh, yes, of course. But I will, um... But you have some domestic matters to take care of first, it seems. Uh, of course. Uh, you do that. I'll leave you two alone then, shall I? Bell? Mr. Marley? What has brought you here at this time of day? I spoke with our friend Dick Wilkins, and he told me that you and your partner, Jacob Marley, are going to buy old Fezziwigs. Yes, we have, in fact. The deal is inked. You just missed the old man. You never told me. I don't discuss my other business dealings with you. Why should this be any different? Dick also told me that you were cutting everyone's wages by half. Yes, well, that can't be helped. Why do you think Fezziwig had to sell? He was careless with his money, paying his staff far more than his competitors and extending credit where he shouldn't. We'll get the company back on its feet, sell it, and make a good profit. Ebenezer. It's business, Bell. And what am I to you then? A bad investment? Don't be silly. I'm not being silly. Another idol has replaced me in your life, and if it can cheer and comfort you in the future, as I would have tried to do, then I have no just cause to grieve. What are you talking about? What idol has displaced you? A golden one. There is nothing in this world as harsh as poverty. How can you condemn with such contempt the pursuit of wealth? You fear the world too much. Because there is much to fear. You were not like this when we first met. I have seen your more noble aspirations disappear one by one until all you care about is profit and gain. I, 
I'm not changed towards you, am I? You are. Do you not see it? Everything I have done has been for us. Then why have we not married? You are certainly wealthier now than you were five years ago. One bad investment, one deal gone wrong, can ruin a man. You think I want to end up like old Fezziwig? I, I think not. I think you are changed. When our contract was made, you were a different man. I have not changed. When we were of one heart, our marriage promised happiness. But now that we are of two, my heart is filled with misery. Oh, so I make you miserable, do I? Are you not miserable? You hardly seem happy at the prospect of us spending our lives together. And so I have no choice but to release you. Release me? Have I ever sought release? In words? No, never. In what then? In a changed nature. Tell me, if you had never promised to marry, would you seek me out and try to win me now? Uh, of course I would. Do you think not? I doubt very much that you would choose a poor and dowerless girl. You, who measures everything in financial gain. And if you did choose her, and turned your back on your own guiding principle, you would in time come to regret your decision. And so, I release you with a full heart, for the love of him you once were, and for what we could have been. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Bill grabs Ebenezer's hand. She begins to cry and runs off. Ebenezer looks down, and there in his hand is the engagement ring he gave her seven years ago. Go after her, you fool! What is wrong with you? Why are you just standing there, man? Move your feet! Ebenezer considers going after her. He heads toward the door when Marley enters from his office carrying two glasses of sherry. Marley hands Ebenezer his glass of sherry. Ah, she's gone then, is she? Um, yes. Don't listen to him! Go after her! What are you waiting for? Come now, Ebenezer. Let us toast our success. Today is a new beginning. Today you have earned the right to be a full partner. How does that sound? A full partner? <laughs> it was promised to you, and I am a man of my word. You have more than proven yourself. And in honor of this occasion, I am going to the expense of having a new sign made with both our names on it. We will be a force to be reckoned with, I dare say. Yes, Marley, a force to be reckoned with. A full partner, my word. A full partner. Cheers. Cheers. Ebenezer and Marley toast their success. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you torture me with these visions? I do not want to think of them. If I cannot change them, why show them to me? So you may consider the path you have tread. Come, there is more for you to see. No more, no more. Please, show me no more. Our time grows short. Hurry. With the snow settled, Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas past find themselves in a cozy parlor. Sitting in a chair is Belle, who's an older woman now and married to her old friend Dick Wilkins. Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas past watch. Where are we, spirit? Belle and Dick's home. This is just five years ago. Oh my, what a day. A wonderful day, my dear. Oh, it feels good to sit down. Do you know I saw an old friend of ours in town this afternoon? Oh, who? Guess. Guess, how can I? Oh, come on. Be a sport. Well, give me a clue then. I'll give you one. Humbug. Mr. Scrooge. <laughs> Mr. Scrooge it was. And how is Ebenezer? Fully engaged with his enterprises, it would seem. 
focused on some very good business opportunities and timely investments, no doubt. And what's wrong with that? We spoke of nothing but business, and I must say he did not seem very happy to see me. Why would I be happy to see you, you scoundrel? He has a peculiar effort on people these days, you know. Crowds part ways like the Red Sea before Moses when Scrooge walks down the street. But I stood my ground and he had no choice but to acknowledge my presence. Scrooge, my good man, how are you? I said. And what was his reply? Good day, sir. He could not even be bothered to look up at who I was. That was all. Good day, sir. Nothing more? Well, who can blame him? His misfortune has been my good fortune. You, my dear, have made me rich beyond anything I could have hoped for. He has his money, but little else. How very sad. Sad? You knew him, Dick, when he wasn't so harsh with the world. He changed when his sister became ill and died. Sooner or later, his true nature would have surfaced, don't you think? His sister was always able to bring out his good and loving nature. If Scrooge ever had a good and loving nature, it has long since been buried and is dead to the world. I hope that's not entirely true. You are kind. You see the good in all. I'm so glad you thought me good enough to marry. You certainly made me wait long enough. You should have said something. (laughs) You were engaged. To make my feelings known before you were free to be mine would have been most inappropriate. And I regret nothing because we are together now, my dear. And nothing in this world can make me happier. Belle and Dick kiss warmly and lovingly and cuddle by the hearth. Scrooge wipes away a tear. Spirit, remove me from this place. Why do you torture me? Why do you show me these things? These are the shadows of things that have been. They are what they are and cannot be changed. Please, I cannot bear it. Leave me. Show me no more. Haunt me no longer. I do not want these memories. Wash them from my mind and leave me in peace. The ghost of Christmas past snaps one last time. The snow swirls hard, almost like a blizzard. Scrooge could feel the ghost's anger in the snow, and in a gust, they disappear.
gust of snow fills the room as Scrooge appears. He's alone in the dark and exhausted from his encounter with the ghost of Christmas past. He rises to his feet and looks around, uncertain of what to expect next. Bah! Humbug! Now you listen here, Marley. No bad memories of the past are going to change me. I'm Ebenezer Scrooge. I can buy good memories if I choose. Scrooge looks at the large clock on the fireplace mantel. It's only half past one. Well, that can't be right. We were gone far too long. The stew. This is because of the stew Mrs. Pinkerton made me. It must have had been spoiled beef. Scrooge moves toward his bed. He climbs in, rests his head and body, and falls asleep rather quickly. At the clanging of the clock, Scrooge sits up in his bed. When the clock strikes two, the ghost of Christmas present. Scrooge clenches his eyes closed. He slowly opens them and finds his bedroom empty. Ah. <sighs> Thank you, Marley. Scrooge lays back down with a great crash comes from the first floor of his home. He slowly moves downstairs to see what the commotion is. There in the front hall, it looks like a grand festive celebration. In the center is a rather large, boisterous being. He has a massive beard, a crown of garland, and long robe of green velvet with white fur. He's a sight to behold. The room is filled with tables of food as deep as the eye could see. Several fir trees drip in decorations. Gifts wrapped in shiny paper and bows are stacked under each tree. Large bows, bunting, garland, candles, and tinsel cover the walls and windows. The spirit turns around and sees Scrooge standing in amazement. <laughs> there you are! I thought maybe you weren't going to come! His eyes are bright and his voice is rich and booming. He begins to laugh. His laugh is so booming that the trees and tables shake. Oh, my word. What sort of spirit are you? What sort of spirit am I? Don't you know me? I do not. You are unfamiliar to me. Am I? Well then, come closer. Come closer and know me better, man. Oh, spirit. I'm exhausted from my previous encounter and cannot go on. I do not wish to seem ungrateful, but I am tired and in need of sleep. The spirit hands Scrooge a great mug of hot rum punch. Here, drink from my cup and you will be restored in more than this and given the strength to continue. We will have to see in little time. Drink up, man, drink up. Scrooge drinks deeply. It's been so long since he took a sip of rum punch, let alone drank a whole mug. <laughs> I am the ghost of Christmas present. You mean to tell me you've never shared in the abundance of the season, never given a gift, received a gift, enjoyed a Christmas feast, a plum pudding, a rum punch? <laughs> Come now, Ben. There was a Christmas or two many years ago when you were a much younger man and I had plans and hopes for a life with Belle when you knew my brothers. That may be true, but that was long ago. Well, then you know the joy of giving and delight of receiving. It is not dead in you. You can awaken these feelings of generosity and kindness. The choice is yours, my friend. Live as you have or change. But I'm too old to change. <laughs> Nonsense. Come, let me show you the joy of the season. It knows no class boundaries. It knows no age. It is shared by all, regardless of race, gender, or wealth. Touch my robe and we shall see how even the poor have much to celebrate on Christmas Day. Scrooge, realizing he cannot just ignore this spirit, begrudgingly reaches out and touches the side of the robe. 
the great spirit slams his hands together and the two disappear in a flash of light. A bright light flashes. Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas present appear in a small but quaint little home. A small fireplace, a table, a water closet, and a medium bed is in a corner next to two smaller beds. In another corner sits a pitifully small tree with a few baubles on it. A family is preparing for the Christmas feast. The table is being set by an older boy while his mother moves about the small fireplace and stove making food. Where is this place? This is the home of your clerk, Bob Cratchit. Have you never been to visit? No. It is a modest dwelling, but a happy one. Peter reaches for a platter on a high shelf. It falls with a loud crash. Goodness me! Settle down before you break something or make me drop a plate myself. Where is father? I don't know. Why isn't he home yet? Oh, your father and Tiny Tim are probably up to some mischief knowing those two. They should have been home long before this, and your sister Martha wasn't nearly this late last Christmas. Look, here's Martha now, Mother. Martha enters. There's such a, there's such a goose, Martha. There? Yes. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear. How late you are. We had a lot of work to finish up last night at the millinery, and there was an awful lot to clear away this morning, Mother. I'm so sorry. I came as quickly as I could. Well, never mind. You are here now. Sit down by the fire, my dear, and warm yourself. There's Father coming. Martha, you must hide. Hide? What for? To surprise Father. Martha quickly hides behind a barrel in the corner. Bob Cratchit comes through the front door in a grand mood with Tiny Tim, who carries a small crutch and wears leg braces. Happy Christmas, Father. <laughs> yes, happy Christmas indeed. Uh, how are you, my dear? Very glad you and Tim are finally home. Mm, it all smells delicious, doesn't it, Tim? Yes, Father. Uh, now, where is our Martha? Oh, not coming, I'm afraid. What? Not coming? Not coming on Christmas Day? But, but why? Too much work to complete. Oh, no. But it is work when many people are without. Oh, Bob. Martha comes out from her hiding place. Merry Christmas, Father. What's this? Martha here? Good heavens. I was here all along. <laughs> oh, I'm quite astonished to find you here, but very pleased. Merry Christmas, Martha. I have missed you so. I've missed you, Father. And how was church? Ah, oh, grand, my dear. The new deacon is a fine fellow. And how did little Timothy be? Now oh, better than gold. Isn't that right, Tim? Yes, Father. Uh, you're a thoughtful child, you know that. Um, do you know what he told me, my dears, on our way home? No. What? <laughs> that he hoped people saw him in church because he was a cripple, and that on Christmas Day it would be good for people to remember who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Maybe one day, Tim will become a deacon. Of course, why not? Our little Timothy a deacon, wouldn't that be a blessing? <laughs> Certainly would. Uh, and you are growing stronger, my boy. Stronger and healthier every day, aren't you? Isn't, uh, isn't he, my dears? The family all agrees, although they know the truth, as Bob gives Tim a big hug. Well, uh, let's eat, shall we? Uh, everything looks and smells so good. Martha and Peter grab a couple bowls of food and place them on the table. Then Mrs. Cratchit walks over with a large platter. She sets it down, revealing a cooked goose, only slightly larger than a pigeon. Oh, my goodness. There never was such a goose as this. The family 
family agrees. They hold each other's hands and close their eyes in prayer. Seems like a very small goose for such a family. And what of it? There are many in this world with far less than that. God rewards those who work hard, and he punishes those who don't. And so, God means to punish this child and this family? I can't believe that. I can't believe that's true. What is to become of Tiny Tim? Amen. 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 I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner. Carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. Die? No, no. No, 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 no. The ghost of Christmas past had no power to change circumstances, but surely you have that power. You are here in the present. Surely you, or some other representative from your realm, can provide for the boy. The power to change the world lies not in my realm, but in the realm of the living. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. You can't let him die, spirit, if it can be helped. Why not let him die and decrease the surplus population? What business is it of yours, Ben? You use my own words against me. <laughs> and why not, Ben? Who are you to decide what men shall live and what men shall die? In the sight of heaven, you may be less fit to live than millions of others, just like this poor man's child. Christmas present waves his hand, and time speeds by to the end of the meal. The family laughs and has just finished dessert. Oh, my dear, you have outdone yourself this year. What a feast. Oh, and your pudding, by far the best you've ever made. Now, wouldn't you all agree? Oh, yes, mother, a very fine pudding. Ever. It was so good. Bob stands and raises his glass, as do all the other Cratchits. Ah, uh, the whole family is here for Christmas. I could not be happier. And so, a Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. Ah, you are quite right, Tim. God bless us, everyone. And so, with that in mind, and in the spirit of the season, I say we toast Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, my dear. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. Oh, my dear, the, the children, Christmas Day. Only on Christmas Day would one ever drink to the health of such a cruel, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Ebenezer Bah Humbug Scrooge. You know how he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor man. Uh, uh, my dear, Christmas, a, a kind, forgiving, charitable season. Oh, very well. I'll drink to his help for your sake and the days, but not for his. Long life to him. A merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt, Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge. God bless Mr. Scrooge. They all dream, but are solemn and quiet for a long moment after the toast. Come, Ben. Tiny Tim. Come, Ben. Let us visit your nephew and see how he celebrates this season. Scrooge takes a hold of the long sleeve of the robe, Christmas present, claps his hands, and they disappear in a flash of light. <laughs> Scrooge and Christmas present appear in a flash outside of a modest home. The outside of the window is decorated with bows and a hearty wreath hangs on the door. Whose home is this? 
Ah, that's right, Ben. Since you refuse to accept any of his dinner invitation, you've never actually been to Senior Nephew's home. Oh. Let's look in on their gathering. The spirit and Scrooge walk right through the window and into the dining room of Fred's home. There's a fine Christmas tree in the room along with handfuls of gifts wrapped in decorative paper. Fred is there as is his wife Bernadette, her sister Molly, and their friend Topper. Let's play a game of yes and no. Now I'll think of something and you try to guess what it is. Okay, I've got it. Is it living or dead? Uh, yes or no questions only, remember. Sorry, is it living? Yes. Is it an animal? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> is it a cow? Moo. No. Does it live in the country? No. In the city, then? Well, yes. Does it growl? Oh, yes. Is it a dog? Woof, woof. <laughs> no. A cat? No. A rat? Oh, no. Is it a horse? No. A jackass? <laughs> yes and no. Hee-haw! <laughs> Oh, I know what it is, Fred. I know it. Oh, what is it? It's your Uncle Scrooge. How dare you? Yes. Excuse me. <laughs> A roar of laughter erupts from the group of friends as Scrooge's blood starts to boil. <laughs> <laughs> when I saw him yesterday, he said that Christmas was a humbug. Can you believe it? A humbug? And he believes it too, poor fellow. <laughs> More shame for him, Fred. What a thing to say. Well, he's a comical old fellow, that's the truth. And not as pleasant as he could be. That's certainly true. But his offences carry their own punishment. And I have nothing to say against him. He is very rich. One of the richest men in London. The richest. What of it? His wealth is of no use to him. I'd make good use of it. Oh, I'm sure you would, Topper. But what good does he do with it? He certainly doesn't make himself comfortable with it. I have no patience with him. Neither do I. Oh, I have. I'm sorry for him, and I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his harsh and uncaring attitude? Himself. Always. Here, he takes it into his head to dislike us, and not come to dinner. And so he loses a very fine dinner and a chance to celebrate the season. Very true. I'm sure it will be a very fine dinner. Thank you. And yet, there was a time when he wasn't such an unpleasant old fool. What are you talking about, Fred? Well, he often wrote to my mother and I, and I came across some letters he'd sent to her when he was a young lad in school and during his courtship to someone named Belle. You had no right to read my letters, Fred. Courtship? Scrooge was engaged? I don't believe it. Believe it? Quite right. Why shouldn't you believe it? Does that change your opinion of him? To know that he was once in love? That he once had hopes of becoming a father and husband? Not any husband I would like. <laughs> so what happened? I made a mistake. Oh, I don't know. The engagement was broken off for some reason, I take it. I guess he lost interest. You know, interest? <laughs> Scrooge is a money lender. Oh yes, I get it now. Well, whatever happened, that's the Scrooge my mother loved. He was a very different man than the man he has become. Oh, Fan. How sad. Isn't it? And so I plan to give him the same chance to have Christmas dinner with us every year, whether he likes it or not. For I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it, and of all people, if he finds me going there, in good cheer, year after year, and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? Merry Christmas. Come have dinner with us. Now that's the only outcome that he takes into his conscience to leave his bull clerk, Bob Cratchit, 50 pounds, then that's something. Here, here, Fred. Well said. 
And so, in considering the merriment he has given us, I think we should drink to his health. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is. Yeehaw! He wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it nonetheless. Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> You treat your nephew with such contempt, and yet he drinks to your health, Ben. He wishes you well. He invites you to dinner every year. My nephew is a dreamer and has no head for business. And yet he is clearly a much happier man than you. He is young, and when you are young, you don't always understand how cruel the world can be. Just because the world can be cruel is no reason for you to be. Come, Ben. My time is almost over. We must hurry. Scrooge holds the robe as Christmas present claps his hands again and they disappear. Scrooge and Christmas present return to his bedroom in a flash. Each man travels a road in life that leads him to certain directions. You yourself are on this road, but it need not be so. No? No. Spirit, I did not want to say anything before, but I have noticed that you are aged. I am. My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Oh, spirit, do not leave me. I do not want to be left alone. Is there nothing more you can show me? There is one more thing you must see. The spirit reveals two children, a boy and a girl, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, and miserable. They kneel at the spirit's feet and cling to his robe. Oh, my good Lord. What are these children? Are these your children? They are man's. Man's? This boy is ignorance, and this girl is want. Beware them both, but most of all, beware this boy. For if he is allowed to grow and flourish, he will bring you nothing but doom. How? Those who know him well live in fear and act on fear with violence and hate. If you encounter this boy, speak against him and all that would use him. Silence him with love and compassion and knowledge, for this is the path towards the understanding of peace. <laughs> Have they no refuge or resource? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? With a final clap of his hands, the ghost of Christmas present, along with the boy and girl, vanish in the darkness. The room is pitch black. Ebenezer feels around looking for a candle. He finally finds a candle and a match. He strikes the match and lights the candle. As he holds the candle out, trying to see in the darkness, a skeletal hand starts moving toward him from the darkness. Scrooge freezes in fear. A hand is holding a ghastly looking lantern. Scrooge lights that lantern and the hand pulls back. The ghost of Christmas yet to come moves forward out of the darkness and into the lantern light. He is a phantom wearing a torn hooded cloak with a gnarled walking stick in his other hand. Am I in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come? The ghost nods its head. And you are here to show me the shadows of things that have not happened yet, but will happen in the future? The ghost nods its head. Oh, spirit, I fear you more than any spectre I have seen tonight. I do not want to continue, but since I know your purpose here is to do me good, 
and I know that you have lessons to teach. I am prepared to bear you company. The ghost opens his cloak and gestures for Scrooge to enter. Scrooge walks into the cloak and the lantern goes out. Ring dice in front of Scrooge, and it appears they have traveled to a familiar part of London. It is the business district. Scrooge has been here many a time, but now it seems almost ghoulish. Two men, Mr. Barthwell and Mr. Oakton, are standing together. Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas yet to come stand nearby. I have heard that Mr. Marsden and Mr. Scrooge were joining forces. Yes, I've heard the very same thing. Two peas in a pod, eh? There was two. <laughs> yes, of course. That's all changed now that he's dead. Oh my. When did he die? Last night, I believe, and quite unexpected. Well, what was the matter with him? God knows. What has he even done with his money? I haven't heard. Eh, left it to his company, I suppose. He hasn't left any of it to me. <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> it will probably be a very cheap funeral, I would imagine. On my life, I don't know of anybody who will go. Do you? Oh, I'll go. Provided that a lunch is provided. How disgraceful. I don't think he ever bought anyone lunch when he was alive. Why would he go to the expense of buying us a lunch now that he's dead? Well, if there is no lunch, I can't think of any reason to go. Can you? No. Nor I. <laughs> Good day. Good day to you. Spirit. Those men, I know them. How far into the future is this? Is it Mr. Marston who has died? Am I to learn from his life and his nature so that I do not make the same mistake? Oh, why do you not speak to me? The ghost of Christmas yet to come opens his cloak. Yes, yes, there is more to see. I understand. <laughs> The lantern lights, Scrooge and Christmas yet to come appear. They are in a shabby, dirty old building. A man, old Joe, sits at a table counting out his money and making notations in his book. He's an abhorrent man, and this is his building. It's a place where illegal goods are bought and sold, and no questions asked. Where is this place? Am I to end up alone and destitute? Am I to lose my fortune? Who is this man and what does he have to do with me? Old Joe hands a few coins to a man and the man runs off. A laundress, Mrs. Dilber, pushes forward past an old charwoman named Mrs. Oliver. Behind them stands a very staunch, pale man. He is Mr. Willoughby, the undertaker. I was there first. Mrs. Dilber shall be after me, and then the undertaker man can be third. Come and sit. Mrs. Oliver throws her bundle to the floor and plops herself down down on a stool with a sigh. What you think, sir? What you think? Mm, it's not much, Mrs. Oliver. Ten shillings. Lots of it, though. All of manure compared to a load of manure is still just manure. That's true indeed. Well, then, let's see what you got then, Mrs. Dilber. No, indeed. Why not? Mr. Willoughby may go before me. Very well. Mr. Willoughby calmly steps forward, gently places a cloth on the table, and produces his plunder. Ha! Mr. Willoughby has been a busy man. Let's see, a seal, 
a pencil case, a pair of brass sleeve buttons. Uh, I give you one pound eight, not another sixpence. Well, oh, thank you, sir. Uh, who's next? Mrs. Dilber steps forward and presents her bundle. Oh, quite a stash, Mrs. Dilber. And what do you call this? Bed curtains? Oh, bed curtains! <laughs> you don't mean to say you took them down, rings and all, with him as lying, eh? And why not? It wasn't apt to catch a cold without him, I dare say. I hope he didn't die of anything catchy, eh? <laughs> Don't you be afraid of that. I wasn't so fond of his company yet that I loiter about if he did. <laughs> <laughs> Is this shirt silk? Oh, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's a best he had, and a fine one too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. What do you call wasting it? Why, putting it on him to be buried in, to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is quite the haul, Mrs. Silver. Bed curtains, a silk shirt, a pair of slippers, some brass vases, and a few other precious olds and ends. Uh, five pounds, six shilling, not a penny more. And this is how it ends. He scared everyone away from him now when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. <laughs> no, indeed. If he wanted to keep him all after he was dead, the wicked old screw, why wasn't he more natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have somebody to look after him when he was struck with death instead of lying, gasping out his last there, all alone by himself. Ah, uh, it's the truest word that ever was spoken, Miss Dilba. It's a judgment on him. Spin it. This is a fearful place. Surely there can be no reason to bring me to this godforsaken part of the city, except that the case of this unhappy man might very well be my own. Yes, the items they have stolen are similar to mine. I see the point. But surely there is someone who feels some emotion caused by this man's death. Show that person to me, I beg you. Scrooge walks into the cloak and they disappear. Scrooge and Christmas Jack to come appear with the spark of the lantern. They are in a home Scrooge does not know, the Powlett family. At a family table, there are two children seated with their mother. Carolyn is pacing back and forth nearby. Her husband, Thomas, comes through the door. Oh, you finally come, Thomas. What have you heard? Is it good or bad? It's bad, I'm afraid. Are we ruined, Thomas? Did he deny you the extra time you asked for? Has he evicted us? No. There is yet hope, Carolyn. Uh, only if he repents, that old miser. Nothing is past hope if such a miracle has happened. He is past repenting, dear. He is dead. Dead? Oh, God be praised. Oh, oh Lord, forgive me. I thought he was merely trying to avoid me. But what I had been told is quite true. Not only was he very ill, but he was dying, even then. To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know. But before that time, we will be ready with the money. And even if we weren't, it would be a bad fortune indeed to find a creditor who is as merciless as he. <laughs> we may sleep tonight with light hearts, Carolyn. Did it. I ask to see some emotion connected with this man's death, and you show me only pleasure. I demand to be shown some tenderness connected with a death. Christmas yet to come wraps his cloak around Scrooge, and they are gone. The 
They reappear and Scrooge looks around. He realizes where they are. It is the home of the Cratchit family. Peter is reading from the Bible, while Martha and Mrs. Cratchit are working on their knitting. Oh, spit it. No. No. No, no. Please, spit it. No. Not Tiny Tim. The ghost just points to the family. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anoints my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness in, in mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Very nice, Peter. What a fine voice you have. Very nice, Martha. You two must read to your father when he gets home. Yes, Martha. He is very late. It is well past his time. He seems to walk so much slower these last few evenings, Mother. Yes, but I have known him to walk very fast with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Very fast indeed. And so have I, often. But he was very light to carry, and your father loved him so. But it was no trouble, no trouble at all. Ah, at last, there is your father at the door. Hello, my dears. Hello, Father. Father. I am so glad you're home. Yes, as am I. Um, what have you been up to, my dears? Peter has been reading to us, and Martha and I have been doing our knitting, haven't we? Yes, we have. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, my dears. You shouldn't wait for me. No, no, no. We'll take our tea together. What took you so long, Robert? Uh, I, I was making some final arrangements, my dear. I wish you could have come. It would have done you. It would have done you good to see how green the place is, how peaceful. But but you'll see it often. Uh, we all will. We shall go there on Sundays, won't we, children? Yes, Father. Every Sunday, Father. Yes, every Sunday. My little child. My little little child. Don't be sad, Father. We love you. Of that I am certain, my dears. Do you know, I, I ran into Mr. Scrooge's nephew, Fred, on the way home from church. And seeing that I was not myself, he asked what had happened to upset me so. I, I'm hardly sorry for your loss, Mr. Mr. Cratchit, he said, and heartily sorry for your good wife. If I can be of service to you in any way, pray come see me. I'm sure he's a good soul. Uh, you would be sure of it, my dears, if, if you saw him and spoke with him. He is a kind-hearted and loving as his uncle Scrooge was cold-hearted and bitter. I shouldn't be surprised. Mark, <laughs> Mark what I say if he gives Peter a better situation. Hear that, Peter? And then Peter will be keeping company with someone and setting up for himself. And what's wrong with that? Uh, not a thing. You're, you are a handsome fellow and a good man, Peter. And one of these days, if you're lucky, you'll meet someone nice that you'll want to spend your life with. <laughs> Very true, my dear, though there's plenty of time for that. And I do hope that in, in the years to come, however or whenever we part from one another, for whatever reason, I'm quite certain that none of us will forget our little tiny Tim, shall we? And this first parting among us. And I know, my dears, that when we remember how patient and how kind he was, even though he was only a little child, we shall not quarrel easily amongst ourselves and forget our little Tim in doing it. Yeah. Never, never, Father. 
I'm very happy. I'm so very, very happy. The family comes together in a hug as Mr. Cratchit begins to weep. I do not belong here. I should not be here. I should not let this poor family grieve in peace. Oh, spirit, I sense our parting is at hand, although I do not know why. Can you not tell me who is this dead man everyone speaks of? The ghost once again opens his cloak. Scrooge reluctantly enters again. The lantern lights as Scrooge opens his eyes and sees that they have arrived in the dreary cemetery of a churchyard. The ghost hands the lantern to Scrooge and points his staff toward a small grave. Spirit, before I draw near to that grave to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be? Or are they the shadows of things that may be only? The ghost points to the grave. Scrooge moves away from the ghost and toward the small grave. It has a simple, inexpensive stone cross with the name Timothy Cratchit carved into it. Leaning against the cross is a small wooden crutch with a worn handle. Scrooge begins rocking and weeping. He grabs the crutch and points it toward the ghost in anger. Spirit, I have had enough. You have shown me nothing but unhappiness, cruelty, and pain. I want to see you no more. Take me back. I demand it right now. The ghost rushes to Scrooge and grabs him around the neck, lifting him up off the ground. Scrooge drops the crutch and begins to search at the ghost's arm. The ghost, in anger, tosses Scrooge across the graveyard toward a larger, ornate tombstone. Scrooge collects himself as he coughs. He's able to get to his knees in front of the tombstone. Whose grave is this? The headstone looks like it is covered in mud, as if handfuls of mud had been thrown at it. Scrooge starts clawing and wiping the dirt and mud away until he can read the name Ebenezer Scrooge scrawled across the gravestone. Scrooge jumps to his feet, backing away from the headstone. Oh no, Spirit. It is as I feared. No. Please have mercy. I am not the man I was. There in front of him, the ground opens. At the bottom of the opening is a plain pine box. The top shoots open. Great chains fly from the coffin and begin to wrap themselves around Scrooge and begin dragging him towards the open coffin. Scrooge cries out as he tries to claw the ground. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Assure me that I may yet change the shadows you have shown me by an altered life. No, no, please, I beg you. Forgive me, spirit. Forgive me. And I will honor Christmas in my heart. I will not shut out the lessons of this night. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirit of all three shall strive within me. Oh, tell me that I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Scrooge is pulled into the coffin. The ghost looks down, and the lid slams shut into darkness. Back in his bedroom, Scrooge appears in the bed, thrashing and tossing about. No spirit. Please, forgive me. I'm a changed man. A changed man. <laughs> Where am I? Oh, my word. I'm in my own bed. Oh, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. I'm in my own bed. And I'm alive. I am alive. Oh, here it is Christmas morning and I am alive. <laughs> 
Scrooge continues to thrash about until he falls out of his bed. He gets up, runs to the curtains, and opens the windows, letting the daylight fill the room. <laughs> I am not dead. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven in the spirits of Christmas be praised. I say it on my knees, Jacob, on my knees. I'm alive. <laughs> Scrooge gives a great sigh of relief and falls back on the bed, laughing as Mrs. Pinkerton comes in with the breakfast tray. She stops when she sees Scrooge lying on the bed laughing. Mr. Scrooge! <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. Mrs. Pinkerton! <laughs> Are you quite all right, Mr. Scrooge? Ebenezer jumps to his feet, runs over, and takes Mrs. Pinkerton in a healthy embrace. Oh, yes, Mrs. Pinkerton! <laughs> I'm as light as a feather! I'm as happy as an angel! I'm as merry as a schoolboy! <laughs> I'm as giddy as a drunken man. Oh, 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 how wonderful to see you. Oh, and look at that. You have not torn down my bed curtains, rings and all. There they are. I am here. You are here. The shadows of things that would have been will not be. I will make certain of that. Will you, sir? Oh, yes. I say, there's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. The ghost of Jacob Marley. And, and, and here, here's where the ghost of Christmas past, long past, no, my past, appeared. <laughs> Did it, sir? And, and here's the window where the snow filled the room. <laughs> Ebenezer looks at Mrs. Pinkerton, she looks at him, and then screams and runs around the room with Ebenezer chasing her, trying to catch her and calm her down. Ah! <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mrs. Pinkerton. Oh, calm yourself, calm yourself. I did not mean to scare you. I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Scrooge. I'm talking about Christmas, Mrs. Pinkerton, the joy of the season. I'm sorry if I frightened you. Uh, here, Mr. Scrooge, are you quite all right? You're acting a bit peculiar, and, and forgive me for saying so, sir, but maybe you should have your head examined. Oh, 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 oh you're quite right. Maybe I should. What a good idea. I wonder what they'll find in it. <laughs> I'll, I'll fetch the doctor, shall I? No, 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 no need. I'm quite sane. Now, run along home to your family. Family. What are you doing here with me on Christmas morning? What horrible old penny pincher would make you work on Christmas Day? Why, you would, Mr. Scrooge. I would. That's true, I would. <laughs> But I won't any longer. Here's a pound note for you to take and spend on you and Mr. Pinkerton this Christmas. A whole pound? Oh, yes. Are you sure? That's a lot of money, that is. Oh, I'm very sure. Oh, why, thank you, Mr. Scrooge. That is most kind and generous of you. Thank you. Merry Christmas, Mrs. Pinkerton. Merry Christmas, Mr. Scrooge. Are you sure you're quite all right? Oh, yes. Never better. <laughs> Mrs. Pinkerton leaps out of the room. Ebenezer flies over to the window and opens it as Mrs. Pinkerton runs out the front door. And remind me tomorrow that I'm giving you an additional five shillings a week. Thank you, sir. Merry Christmas. A Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. Ha -ha! <laughs> Ebenezer takes a deep breath of the cold, crisp morning air. He looks down and sees the boy from the night before. You there, boy. What are you doing in front of my door again? Nothing, sir. Oh, Grant, do you know the butchers in the next street but one at the corner? Of course I do. Ah, an intelligent boy. Do you know whether or not they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging here? Not the little prize turkey, the big one! The one as big as me? What a delightful child. Yes, that's the one. 
it's hanging there still. Is it? Good. Here, take these coins and go and buy it. Go buy it? Are you out of your nut? <laughs> no, 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 no. I am not off my nut. Oh, good heavens. <laughs> I am in earnest, I assure you. Go and buy it and tell them to have it ready to be picked up with all the trimmings within the hour. Come back with the receipt and I'll give you two shillings. Come back with it in less than ten minutes and I'll give you five. Right away, girls. <laughs> Look at him go. Oh, 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 I don't deserve to be so happy. But I am. I can't help it. <laughs> what to do? What to do? A whole day. A whole day to spend celebrating the season. <laughs> Ebenezer quickly gets himself changed and ready to go out and meet the world as a brand new man. <laughs> It is Christmas Day and the street is filled with people. There are people on their way to see family. Others are doing last minute shopping and a group is singing Christmas carols. There's a lot of laughter and conversation and Ebenezer is enjoying all the activities and joins in greeting people. Good morning to you. Merry Christmas. A Merry Christmas to you. People passing by are rather shocked to see Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge in a good mood. Ebenezer then sees Mr. Longhorn walking along, collecting coins in a charity box from passers-by. Scrooge rushes over and approaches him. My dear sir, how are you? Uh, very well, Mr. Scrooge. I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. You are Mr. Scrooge, aren't you? Yes, that is my name, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon. I would like to make a donation to your fund. Ebenezer reaches into his pocket and pulls out a small coin bag. He pulls out a few pennies. Mr. Longhorn gives a weak smile. Then Ebenezer reaches back in and pulls out a pound coin, then a second, and drops the coins into Mr. Longhorn's charity box. Lord bless me, my dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please, not a shilling less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favor? My dear sir, I, I don't know what to say to such generosity. Don't say anything. And do include my partner, Jacob Marley's name, on the donation, if you please. This was all his doing, you see. Well, uh, who's ever doing it was, I, I thank you very much, Mr. Scrooge. Uh, you've helped us exceed our goal by much more than we could have imagined. Uh, thank you, sir. It is I who must thank you. And I have some ideas about creating a merchant association to raise funds for the poor throughout the year. Oh, well, then, that would be a wonderful gesture. Yes. You must come and see me, and we can discuss this further. Yes, Mr. Scrooge. Uh, thank you. Uh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, my good man. Thank you very much. I am much obliged to you. I thank you 50 times. Bless you. Mr. Longhorn rushes off as Ebenezer waves. Ebenezer turns around and he sees Belle and Dick Wilkins. Ebenezer approaches the couple. At first they don't see him, but then they turn in his direction. Ebenezer is overjoyed to see them. My word, Belle. Ebenezer? Yes, it is I. Oh, Belle, I'm so glad to see you. Ebenezer takes Belle's hand and gives it a kiss. Ebenezer. Oh, I'm so sorry, that was most inappropriate of me. I'm just so overwhelmed to see you again after so many years. This is a day filled with blessings. How are you, my dear? Well, Ebenezer gives Dick a hearty handshake. And Dick, Dick Wilkins, my good friend, how long has it been since I've called you that? Um, uh, yes. And how is your family? Well. Uh, yes, very well. I'm glad to hear it. It has been too long. We must not be strangers, eh? Here we are, living in the same city, and we do not spend any time together. Well, that will never do. 
I think you and Dick must come to see me, and we must have a good visit, and you can tell me all about your dear family. How does that sound? I do wish us to remain friends, if you will allow it. Of course we will. Of course, Ebenezer. Uh, Merry Christmas. Yes, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. It is so good to see you. Ebenezer waves them on their way and then stands enjoying the carolers. Mr. Marsden, who happens to be passing by, sees Ebenezer and approaches. Ah, ah, very nice. Very beautiful. Merry Christmas. Ah, Mr. Scrooge, I was just on my way to your office. (laughs) Well, you may go to my office, but you won't find me there. (laughs) Oh, no, Mr. Scrooge, of course not. You are here. I most certainly am. Well, then, maybe we can walk back together. What? At work on Christmas Day? What is Christmas Day to you, sir? Oh, it's not the day. It's the spirit, my friend. The spirit of Christmas that I celebrate today and every day. You should try it. I don't think I'll try such a thing, sir. No? No. Oh, what a shame. Well, Mr. Martin, I happen to belong to a group of businessmen that are raising a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth at this festive time of year, and I would be most pleased if you would make a donation. I don't make merry myself at Christmas. And I can't afford to make idle people merry. Yes, 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 yes. I heard it all, said it all, and it's all a cluster of cobswallop. I think I will have to reconsider doing business with you, Mr. Scrooge. Well, that is entirely up to you, Mr. Martin. But in the meantime, why don't you donate that hundred pounds you made yesterday? Mr. Scrooge, have you lost your mind? (laughs) You're not the first one to accuse me of losing my mind today, and you probably won't be the last. But that is no reason for you not to donate. You can afford it. If I was to give away my money to anyone who asked for it, it would be not be long before I found myself in the poorhouse. Good day, sir. Merry Christmas. Bah. And a happy new year. Humbug. <laughs> Humbug indeed. <laughs> well, he'll take some work, that one. Oh dear, look at the time. I must hurry. <laughs> Ebenezer walks up to Fred's home. It is decorated for Christmas and looks identical to the image he saw when he was there with the ghost of Christmas present. He stands outside the door listening carefully. Is it an animal? Oh, yes. Is it a cow? Moo! No. Does it live in the country? No. In the city, then? Why, yes. Does it growl? Oh, yes. Is it a dog? Woof, woof. (laughs) No. A cat? No. A rat? (laughs) No. Is it a horse? No. A jackass? (laughs) Yes and no. (laughs) Hee-haw! Oh, I know what it is. I know what it is, Fred. I know it. Well, what is it? Ebenezer hears his moment and blasts through the front door. It's It's your Uncle Scrooge. The foursome turn and look and are stunned for the moment, and then there's an uneasy laugh, and then Fred speaks up. Why, bless my soul, so it is. Uncle. Fred. I have come to dinner, if you will still have me. Of course, Uncle. I'm so glad that you are here. Pray, what changed your mind? The ghost of Jacob Marley changed my mind. The spirit of Christmas, past, present, and future changed my mind. Your words changed my mind, Fred. You're right. Christmas is a kind forgiving and charitable time. A time when men and women open their hearts and think of their fellow man. 
a time for mercy, charity, and benevolence. And so, in the memory of your dear mother and my beloved sister, I will honor Christmas and keep it all the year. And I say along with you, God bless it. Oh, Uncle, I could not be happier. Welcome, Uncle. Bless you. Bless you all. Now I must be off, but I will return shortly. Pressing business to attend to. Business, Uncle, on Christmas? Business for the heart and soul, my boy. I will return in an hour, and we shall have what smells to be a most delicious meal. Thank you, Uncle. I am off. Ebenezer leaves his nephew's home with a smile and hurries along to the butcher. He picks up the prized turkey and goes along his way. A short walk later, and Ebenezer finds himself in front of the home of the Cratchit family. Ebenezer hunches himself down, returns to his familiar scowl to his face, and wraps his cane on the door. Mr. Cratchit enters. Is that Cratchit? Oh, my, yes, Mr. Scrooge. You, sir, were not at work this morning as we discussed. What is the meaning of this? Uh, well, uh, but, but, Mr. Scrooge, sir, uh, we, we did discuss it. Uh, it. It is Christmas Day, and you gave me the day off. I? I? Ebenezer Scrooge gave you the day off? Would I do a thing like that? Well, no. I, I mean, yes, well, well no, but uh, you, 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 you did, sir. Bob Cratchit, I have had my fill of this. And I've had my fill of you, Mr. Scrooge. Oh, no, quiet now. <laughs> Is that so? Yes. I see then. Well, Bob Cratchit, if that is the case, so be it. Therefore, you, Bob Cratchit, are... Uh, yes, Mr. Scrooge. Giving a rise. What? What? I see your family and your home, and I'm not going to stand for this sort of life any longer, Mr. Cratchit, and therefore I have no choice but to double your salary. Bob Cratchit freezes at the words. He starts to fall back into his family. Cratchit? Cratchit? Uh, I, I'm sorry, did, did, did you say double my salary? Yes. My salary? Your salary. Uh, are you quite yourself, Mr. Scrooge? I have never been more myself. Oh, a merry Christmas, Bob. A merry Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, that I have given you for many a year. I'll double your salary and assist your struggling family. How does that sound? Uh, very good, Mr. Scrooge. Thank you. We will discuss your affairs tomorrow morning, my friend. Uh, yes, Mr. Scrooge. Oh, oh, I almost forgot. Peter, outside is a gift for your family. Be a lad and bring it in for me. Peter hurries outside and then comes barreling through the front door with a very large package of shiny paper and bows. He sets it on the table. Ebenezer picks up Tiny Tim and stands him on the table. Now, Tim, my boy, you do the honors. Tim pulls on the biggest bow and the shiny paper falls to the sides, revealing a massive turkey. It's bigger than me. Enjoy it, Bob. You deserve it. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Scrooge, would you like to stay? Thank you for the offer, Mrs. Cratchit. But I am spending Christmas with my nephew. Of course, Mr. Scrooge. Have a blessed day. Merry Christmas to you all. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Mr. Scrooge. Oh, and, and Bob, tomorrow morning before you arrive, I want you to go buy more coal for the office. Let's make up the fires and warm the place up. <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Ebenezer leaves the Cratchit home feeling better than he has in many, many years. Ah, Christmas time be praised. Thank you, Jacob. 
may ye yet find some peace. Merry Christmas to all. And do you know, Ebenezer was better than his word. He did it all and much more. And to Tiny Tim, who I'm happy to say did not die, Scrooge was a second father. Ebenezer became as good a friend, as, as good a boss, and as good a man, and as good old city of London knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. And from that time on, it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man and alive possess the knowledge. May that be truly said of us all. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Thank you everyone for watching and now a word from our cast, our narrator, Marcia Hill. Merry Christmas to all and to all of us, a much better year ahead. Our Ebenezer Scrooge, Miles Q. Turner. Merry Christmas and a safe and happy new year to everyone. Our Ghost of Christmas past, Bernadette and Carolyn, Paige Peters. Merry Christmas, happy new year and a healthy new year. Our Bob Cratchit and Mr. Willoughby, Paul Snyder. Thank you so much for watching and enjoy your holiday season. Our Mrs. Cratchit, scullery maid and Mrs. Dilber, Melissa Daniels. Wishing you a joyful and healthy season. Our fan and our Martha Cratchit, Annie Burns. Merry Christmas, everyone. Happy holidays. Our Ebenezer at age 15 and our Peter Cratchit, Jackson Gray. Merry Christmas. Our Mr. Fezziwig, Mr. Longhorn, and Old Joe, uh, Stefan Benoit. Merry Christmas, everybody. Our Belle and our Molly, Lauren Reibold. I pray everyone has a safe and happy holiday season. Our, uh, sorry, our Mrs. Fezziwig, our Mrs. Pinkerton, and our Mrs. Oliver, Bonnie Brewer. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thanks for watching. Our Dick Wilkins, Mr. Fillmore, and Mr. Oakton, Joel Knapper. Merry Christmas. Our Fred, our Ebenezer at 21, 27, and Mr. Barthwell, Ryan Marcotte. A very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you all. Our Mr. Marsden, Topper, and Thomas, Rob Beicher. <laughs> Merry Christmas and peace. And finally, our tiny Tim, our orphan boy, and our Ebenezer at age eight, Andrew Bush. Merry Christmas and God blesses everyone. Have a good new year.